let's move on to the next uh, part of the agenda. So now we have a uh, reserve 30 minutes before the next five minute break to present and discuss uh, examples of the effects and recommendations that you have available in the current open catalog of uh, at, para, at the Penta website. Okay, so um, just as a reminder, remember we have we are focusing on developing parallel code using C, C++, and Fortran, for multi-core CPUs and GPUs, using in particular OpenMP and OpenCC, directive-based application program interfaces. Also, remember, bring to your mind, that we want to uh, make all the defects and recommendations fit into any of these three stages. Stage number one, preparation of the code don't care about parallelism yet. Understand how the code is written because this will have a, bit, a deep impact on your productivity and the final results that you will get. Stage number two, focus at that, at that stage on understanding the semantics of the code or the more relevant parts of the code, typically the hotspots, those parts of the code that consume most of the runtime of your application and now focus on understanding how to parallelize it safely. Don't care about performance. If you're lucky, the code will run several times faster. In other cases, it will run several times slower. But this is not the way you need to put your attention at this stage. They're doing it correctly and safely. And finally, in stage number three is where you need to care about performance. If you are already uh, have speed up your application by a factor of 10x, maybe you're done and you don't really need to put a lot of effort in stage three. But typically when you go to GPU, the first version usually slows down very significantly the application because remember, you have to address two main challenges, data movement and parallelizing the code without data races. And data movement takes a lot of time. So doing redundant or unnecessary uh, data transfers from the CPU memory to the GPU memory and back from the GPU memory to the CPU memory to transfer the results to the application is the number one performance penalty in GPU programming at this moment. So in the stage number three, when you go to GPU, typically you will need to work uh, significantly on the stage number three. Okay, so um, in this part of these slides, we will focus on the catalog itself, one of the pillars of ensuring parallel programming best practices. So feel free to click on this uh, link and go to appentra.com knowledge checks and take a look at the defects and recommendations that we found there. And each defect and recommendation comes with its own example codes that are available publicly as well in a GitHub repository. So, Every defect, every recommendation, every check comes with examples and with documentation. So you can learn and take examples to understand the importance of this and the relevance of this. So let's uh, take a look at several examples of defects and recommendations related to prepare your code for parallelism. So if you look at uh, the listing of the current recommendations, we will, you can see we have 16, and we will focus on recommendation number one, declare global variables as function parameters. Recommendation number two, declare scalar variables in the smallest scope possible. We have already talked about this, so we will just, we'll uh, go through it very, very fast. Also other recommendations to increase compiler code coverage or tooling code coverage. That is, how can you deal with typical hard examples or hard codes that suffer from pointer aliasing or from a data a code structure that makes it very difficult for tooling, even for OpenMP to work and generate efficient parallel code. Okay, so PWR 11, outline loop to increase compiler and tool code coverage is a way of handling uh, some types of pointer aliasing. 
Number two, number 12, is again related to data scoping and data sharing. Uh, typically what we see in many, many applications is that we have a big data structure and we pass, give access to the, all the elements or almost all the elements of the data structure across many functions, many modules, many loops. What this makes is that exposes data in parts of the code where that data is not necessary because we are passing typically the whole structure or a pointer to a structure. So this is a convenient way of passing information across the whole program, but also it's a very important source of uh, data races and data movement issues because parts of the code can access data that should never be accessed there because of bugs that you can run, uh, go beyond the memory for an array, but still being valid accesses for a given loop, and you might be accessing data that you should never access. So we need a way to hide data and restrict in the, in the hot spots of our code, the access to the data that is relevant in that part of the code, not to all any other data that is not relevant for that part of the code, okay? So this is recommendation 12, pass only required fields, I'm particularly dealing with the structs because this is a typical uh, example implementation in real codes. Structs with pointers to more structs with pointers to dynamic arrays. Just to give an example, a simple example. And also we have highlighted finally the recommendation 16 that is about um, how do we design the data structure? We need to uh, represent particles in a 3D domain. So we have an array of points that re represent the X, Y, and Z coordinates of each particle. So this way of implementing the data structure as an array of structs has a lot of advantages from the point of view of understanding the domain, the scientific domain. But from the point of view of parallel programming and for performance, it is many times inhibiting many compiler optimizations, many the correct behavior of many uh, programmers and clauses in OpenEP or OpenACC. So this is the reason why we have selected these six recommendations to be discussed next. So recommendation number two, declare scalar variables in the smallest scope possible. Just a remark of the question in the Slack channel. For scalars, this is straightforward. Just we need to guarantee that the G is used only in the scope of the loop and not afterwards, because that can be can break the compilation of your code by moving the declarations of the variables. You need to do it safely. And dealing with arrays is not that straightforward because in, in the parallel region, in the parallel execution, you will be creating as many copies of an array as threads you create. If you have 10 threads and small arrays, you can run safely and the technique can be beneficial for your code. But if you are spanning for hundreds of threads with large arrays of megabytes or gigabytes, you can easily run out of memory or have memory issues in your code, okay? So we will uh, work on that to release new uh, recommendations related to as smallest scope possible for arrays. This is definitely very, very, important and interesting for our community. So let's see the recommendation 16. Use separate arrays instead of an array of structs. If you click on this website, you will see that all the uh, web pages have the same structure to facilitate reading. First, we describe the issue that we have. Then we describe the relevance. Why is it important for building good quality code, and in particular, whenever we, we think it's easy to understand, we relate it to parallel programming. Then we uh, include a section called actions. That is, okay, you have an issue, a recommendation or a defect. Action is, how can we fix it? How can we overcome this issue in our code? So every day. Recommendation of defect comes with action. It's actionable in the sense that it will always provide you with 
a suggestion or an action to fix the defect and the recommendation. And very important to really understand this and understand it from the point of view of learning, but also from the point of view of applying this to your own codes, you need examples. We need humans learn very well by examples. So you will always have code examples where we highlight and describe as briefly as possible the problem. Here, the problem is that we have an array at line eight of 1,000 points, each point being a struct, a derived data type that consists of three fields, X, Y, and Z, that represent the coordinates in a 3D domain of each of the particles, of each of the points. And then the loop makes a processing of all, for all the points. So the suggestion here is do not use this array of structs. Prefer to use plain arrays. So this is counterintuitive from the point of view of designing a good data structure for sequential coding, because we usually prefer to resemble the real domain. But if you think from the point of view of parallelism, having separate arrays guarantees that all the memory for all the points, for all the particles, the coordinate X will be contiguous in memory. The same for the coordinate Y, the same for the coordinate Z. So depending on how you process the particles, you process the points, you can benefit from data locality. Whenever you need the X coordinate of the particle one, you will have available very fast in the cache of the processor, the X coordinate of more particles that may be processed next. So if you write your code in such a way that you reuse all this information, you will have benefits from the point of view of data locality, so performance. But also remember, many parallel programming APIs rely on two parameters to make data movement. One is provide me with a pointer to the starting, the first position that you want to transfer, that you want to move. And then provide me with the number of elements, contiguous elements that you want to move. And sometimes, they also provide an strike, that is the separation between the elements. Instead of being consecutive in memory, they are uh, separated by a given a fixed amount, unknown amount of elements. So with these three parameters, uh, base address, number of elements, and strike, you can uh, program many communications in MPI, many data transfers in OpenMP or in OpenACC. So again, having all the data continuously in memory and avoiding structs and pointers to structs facilitates the development of correct and performant parallel code using the parallel programming APIs, okay? We will see in part three next week that this is essential for the CPIC example, but also it is very intrusive because whenever you change, make this change in very simple codes, it's easy to see, but in codes like CPIC that use make a heavy use of extracts, pointers to extracts and arrays. Changing and redesigning the data structure can have a lot of impact in, in how you write the rest of the code. And you may be, need to modify not one function, maybe 100 functions in your code, okay? So this is about recommendation 16, and we will see it in the part three in the CPIC use case uh, next week. Related to this also, the problem of data scoping is an important problem when you go to parallelism. When you go to parallelism, you usually need, for each variable of your code, you need to decide if it's going to be thread private, if it's going to be shared between many threads, if it's going to be reduced because it is a reduction variable, or if it needs to another way of handling the variable like thread private, uh, first private, or last private. So to decide on this, you need to know for a given loop, imagine the loop in the function ADD, line 12, you need to know what is the, the, what is the shape, the data structure of the variables A and B. And for the declaration of the procedure, you, you cannot infer that information. So if you want to infer that information, you need to track the usage, the call sites of ADD function in the full function and see how this, this variable, this code is in both and is using global variables. So instead of using global variables in a function, why not 
explicitly declaring those variables in the signature of the function. So whenever you do the analysis of the code, you don't need to analyze the whole code. You just need to analyze the function because the declaration of the data type information and how the information is used in the loop that makes the computation, everything is available in the function. So this, again, is a way of reducing the amount of time you need to analyze to invest in analyzing the code to understand how to parallelize it. Okay, so this recommendation is declare global variables as function parameters so that the function, bar function doesn't access global variables. It accesses uh, parameters of the function. So here you can see that in the uh, fixed code, you can see that the ADD function has two additional arguments, A and B, with the data type, a pointer to integer in this case. And this makes explicit also in the call side in line 19, which are the, what is the data flow in the foo function across different invocations of the init function and of the ADD function. So again, it facilitates the analysis of the interactions between different functions of your code. So this is definitely a good practice for uh, when you try to address the parallelization of big complex applications. Um, can you pause to answer a couple of questions in the Slack, please? Uh, yes. In the general? Yes. Do you want me to read them to you? Uh, I have a word from code, parallelized with MPI. Uh, well, I think that that question is not, that by William Foley is not directly related to what we are seeing. We would need to know more about the code, or how it is written, the Fortran code, to know if it is a big issue or not. Is it running into the so GPU? Defer that question to, um, to later with um, more, with, with a threat for that question, and we can back and forth with the answer in, in Slack instead of verbally. The other question is, would these optimizations work for C++ codes using STL containers? Uh, as we said, uh, we have so far formulated them and working with C, C++ and Fortran codes, but C++ limited to C-like code that doesn't work with the STL directly. So we need, of course, to work and extend them to make them work and valid for C++ containers of the STL as well. And finally, there is another question of a small matrices of three by three. Again, th that question is interesting because it is not only about the declaration of the matrix and how what is the size of the matrix if it is three by three, a small one. This is an important property. It's about how it is used, how many matrices are used, how many matrices are created, how they are processed in different invocations of routines. So we need to know how these three by three matrix multiplies are, are used in the, in the code. So definitely it's something interesting to, to understand. So I, I'm assuming everybody is able to um, watch Slack questions as well and simultaneously. Otherwise, uh, raise your hand and we could re re repeat the question or um, also encourage you to join Slack so you can watch questions live while uh, Manuel is answering them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's continue. Let's go to another recommendation, that is the recommendation 11. Okay, this is again, typical example of um, real application. Typical part of the code that allocates memory, frees memory, complex data structures that are malloc and initialized. And then in the same routine, we analyze, uh, we process that part of the, different parts of the data stored in the data structure. So mixing 
memory allocation, memory free with the computation, makes it very difficult and very hard for tooling and compilers to know exactly what is going on in the code. Okay, because as you remember, pointer aliasing is one probably the major a nightmare of compilers and tooling. Current in order to guarantee that the optimizations they suggest or they do are all correct. So, in practice, what experts usually do is separate uh, memory management from the point of view of malloc and free for the computation part. And this is what we see, for instance, when you try to locate the hotspot functions of your code when you move to the GPU. It usually focuses on loops that are compute intensive and that process data. These kernels, these hotspots, usually don't contain the memory allocation and the memory free. So how can we systematize this? What we can do is we can try to find loops in the codes that are only using the data pointed by the pointers. So in this case, we have a structure with a pointer syntax in C, and we are the reference in an array, e, A. So we are really accessing data, not the pointers themselves. We are not manipulating the pointers. We are not traversing the pointers. So what could be very helpful for tools is to extract this loop in a separate function. We call it bar in the sample below. And in the signature of the function, specify the data type of the array and pass, if possible, not the data structure, but the plane array. In this case, you will provide more opportunities for tooling and compilers to optimize your code and find and help you to parallelize the code. Okay, so this is uh, contrary to what sometimes is, is recommended that is an inlining functions to expose more, more opportunities for parallelism, but they are not conflicting with each other because what they are, they are recommended in different uses of the call sites of the computations. In outlining, we are trying to avoid pointer arithmetic and isolate the processing of the data pointed by the pointers from the pointer arithmetic itself to enable more opportunities for parallelism. In inlining, we usually don't have this aliasing problem and we have loops that are already processing plane arrays and we have functions that are making it difficult for the compiler to understand what is going on in the inside the function. So in that case, we don't have pointer aliasing. We just have a function invocation that is a, a hidden region of the code that the compiler cannot uh, analyze with precision. Okay. So in those cases, we typically suggest inlining. So this recommendation for loop outlining is compatible with loop inlining. It's just that we recommend one or the other in different use cases in your code bases. Okay. Okay, and finally, another one related to structs. You can see that we focus a lot of, on structs or, or derived types because in the end, it is something that we see in all the real codes. Modules, classes, or structs with fields and functions, methods attached to the class or to the module. So in the end, we need, we usually pass and give access to the module to all the functions that need it but we usually give access to all the module, to all the struct, not to only the required fields that are needed for a given part of the code. And this is where recommendation 12 comes into play. You can see in the example that foo is a pointer to a data structure that contains two plane arrays of integers. But inside the function, only one array, the array named A is used, not the array B, but array B is exposed to the pointer. So potentially, a B could be accessed inside the function, which is not desirable and is, can be at some point error prone. So what we should recommend and what this recommendation does is tells you, okay, look at the fields that are really used inside the function. Only A, just pass as a parameter of the function, the field and invoke the function passing only that field at the call side. Okay, so again, you can see that many of the recommendations for the preparation stage have to deal with derived types, pointers, so deep copy problem in data movement, also functions, declaration of functions and globals, which are typically 
access everywhere in the code. So this is not good practice and we need to invest some time in narrowing down the visibility of the, the accessibility of the data in the in real parts of the code where the data is not relevant. So it should be hidden, it should not be accessible in those parts, okay? Okay, so let's, uh, these are the selected recommendations for this part of the slide. There's a question for the previous slide, please. Yeah. By Kiran Nona. Yes. Right. It's, I'm going to read it. In some applications, the dimensionality of the system is not given. So instead of having a separate array for its dimension, can we have an array of pointers that forms the base address for its dimension? Okay, having an array of pointers in C typically means that you have a double pointer, double asterisk asterisk. In Fortran, you can arrays are built-in data types with different semantics than C. So in general, you are still exposing uh, multiple levels of pointer they're referencing to the compilers and to the tools, which are potential sources of, uh, of defects and issues when running the code in parallel. So choosing the data structure is usually the preferred way, if possible, is to use plain arrays, arrays of data, not arrays of pointers of array of structs or arrays of a complex data type. Okay, that's a general rule, but of course we need to study each case and how the data is actually processed in the loops. That's also very relevant. You cannot dissociate the design of the data structure, the data type, from how the data is actually processed in the code. You need to analyze both of them all together for your hot spots. Okay, so it will be interesting to see that case in, in the hands-on sessions or in the Q&A during these upcoming two weeks. Okay, so let's move on to the more defects in for stage number two. Remember, stage number two. Now, assume we have prepared the code. We have dealt with all of these questions that you have raised in the, the channel. And you have an implementation that works correctly, sequentially, and is prepared for parallelism according to best practices. Now what you want to do is what? Create your first parallel version and make it compile and run correctly and successfully on your target platform, either a multi-core CPU or a GPU. This is the goal here. So for this, essentially, we are going to see five defects. Essentially, we have tried to relate them to, in general, to multi-threading execution of the CPU, but also to the GPU and to general parallel program, uh, sequential programming uh, issues that we can find. So we have selected these defects. Number one, invalid OpenMP multi-threading data scoping. Number three, missing array, array range in data copy to accelerate the device. Number four, out of bound array memory access. This is an example of something that happens in the code itself in C, independently of uh, the parallel region. It can happen in the sequential input code. And number six and number seven are missing deep copy of non-contiguous data to the GPU and unprotected multi-threaded recurrence. So let's see these uh, defects in more detail. Okay, um, the example we have selected here is a typical error. That is, in, uh, we assume that typically when we go through OpenMP, that all the loop headers that have a loop index, this index is usually a third private by default in the parallel, in the OpenMP parallel region. But this is not the case. And this can change or might change over time in OpenMP or OpenACC standard. So what is happening here is that we have by default a, a shared a, a behavior for the loop indices i and j. For the loop in this i, that is the outermost, that is where the pragma, OpenMP pragma is attached, so the loop whose iterations of which are distributed among the threads, this is thread private by default by the standard. 
but inner loops are not set private, are shared by default. So J is going to introduce data races because you will have all the threads in the parallel region doing concurrent access to one single memory location in the shared memory space and accessible through the J variable, okay? So this is about a, a simple problem of data scoping in OpenMP. That also applies to CPU, GPU, and even to OpenECC with different rules in the different standards and different platforms. So in this case, the way to fix it is to explicitly privatize the loop indices i and j. Maybe privatizing i is not strictly needed, but it will definitely make the code easier to understand and maintain, especially if you think of other people, other developers that didn't code the code, so that he has the information about data scoping explicit in the practice. And they don't have to learn what assumptions the OpenMP standard in this case is doing. Okay, so this is definitely uh, an interesting, simple, but very interesting uh, defect. Defect number four. We have selected uh, an, a use case in this case using sequential code. Whenever we process arrays, we usually uh, have a, a loop index that traverses a, a space from zero to 99 in this case. And we are accessing all the elements of an array from position zero to position uh, 99. But sometimes the algorithm itself, think for instance in stencil computations, you need to access to a, in an array to a memory location given by the index A of i, but also you need to access to adjacent positions, a of i plus one, i minus one, i plus one, j plus one into the arrays. So in general, you will need to understand and guarantee that each array access, access that you have is not doing an out of bounds memory access so that it doesn't access to an invalid position of the array. This is a typical error in extensive computations, and when you move to the GPU and you move the data, sometimes the, 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 the threads in the GPU are accessing out of bounds in the memory or the data transfer to the GPU. So guaranteeing and checking that all the array accesses are in bounds is very important, even before going adding parallelism. And of course, this can be checked sequentially in sequential code and can also be this out of bound memory Checking can also be done in multi-threaded code, what is happening in each thread, okay? So remember, out of bound memory access is a very important one and is the source of many other defects that we can implement and support. Okay, we already saw this one in the introduction and I want to stop a bit more time here because deep copy is definitely a very important concept uh, for GPU programming because deep copy is about the difficulty that the tools and the compilers have to manage and transfer data from the CPU memory to the GPU memory when the data is represented in the code using structs with pointers and a combination of pointers and structs. So typically the array of structs problem, okay? So what this means is that when you have double pointers or you have a race of structs of, or a race of structs of a race, a complex uh, a data structure, in general, all the data you, that you are going to process in your algorithm, in general, you don't have the tool, doesn't have the guarantee that all of this data is continuous. And remember, what is preferred by the tools is that the data to be processed or the data to be moved from CPU to GPU back and forth is contiguous in memory because this will make the data movement much more efficient for the hardware and for the code generated by the compilers and the tools. So here, in the case of OpenMP, you could think that moving, mapping a double pointer A to the GPU, where the data type is a double pointer in asterisk asterisk might work uh, without doing anything else. But in practice, this doesn't work because this is a simple case of the more general deep copy problem. You don't have the guarantee that all the data of your, the rows of your array 
will be contiguous in memory. It depends on how the memory is actually allocated. And that part of the code is not seen in the full function by the tool. Okay, so it is best practice recommendation to code with enter data and exit data in OpenMP and each contiguous slice of data map it individually to the GP. So here, what you are seeing is that first, before the code, the trips distribute parallel for the double pointer is mapped so that first, the, uh, the first uh, dimension is mapped. So all the pointers are mapped to the GPU, reserving 10 elements on the GPU memory. And after that, the sec the, in the loop, 10 times is executed the enter data directive, each enter data directive allocating a different slice corresponding to different rows of the 2D matrix. And the memory allocated in the GPU is this pointer is initialized in the, in the first dimension array on the GPU memory directly. So you need to code that explicitly. This resembles very well how the data structure is malloced on the CPU. First, you malloc 10 elements, and then you iterate on the 10 elements to do one malloc per row. And the, the pointer returned by the malloc is initialized, is stored in the first array. So you need the same kind of processing to do the data mapping, okay? And this is for transferring from CPU to GPU. When transferring back from the GPU to the CPU, you have to mimic the free uh, way, the, the way you do free, you free the memory on the CPU. You first free all the different slices for the different rows, and finally you free the uh, 1D array, the main array of pointers, okay? So this is interesting because this is widely used in C. People many times we think that this double pointer in C behaves as a 2D array in Fortran. And in Fortran, we have the guarantee that the memory will be contiguously allocated by the language, by the compiler. And this is not the case in C. So we need to care about this, okay? Um, let's move on to the two final defects we want to describe today in this section. And this defect number three is missing array range in data copy to the GPU. Uh, again, you can assume that just to map arrays in C, look at the first example, Pragmo in line number two, Pragmo MP target map to A comma B. So that you can assume that this will transfer all the needed data to the GPU memory. But the problem is that in the CPU side, in the C programming language, this pointer to integer can point to one element, to size element, or to more elements than size. And this is not this dimensionality is not known in the language, in the information available in the code. So you need to provide that additional information by adding in the line number two, the elements, the first element that you want to map to the GPU, and the number of elements that you want to map. So for instance, to map an array A of size elements, you write A in brackets, zero uh, double column size. First element, number of elements, okay? <clears throat> and this works just fine for, let's call it one D arrays, a pointer to, data, to basic data types like integer, double, or float. So this missing, the data, this missing array range is a defect, it's something that will not work and will not be portable across all the OpenMP compilers. And finally, we, have in, we are putting, putting emphasis on data structures, on data movement, how to map data ranges, but don't forget that we need to also pay attention to data races, to the computations themselves, that they are being parallelized. And this is an example. Remember that in many cases, you can have reduction operations that are well supported in the languages in OpenMP and OpenSea and you can parallelize them, but you can have types of computations that are not reductions, that are in general recurrences, meaning that you can have dependencies between iterations, so the iterations cannot be distributed and executed in parallel in different threads. So this is a bug in the first code. OpenMP parallel 4 will provide wrong results 
with this recurrence because you have dependencies between consecutive iterations of the loop. So you need to handle recurrences. There are many different ways of handling it through atomic, critical sections, now more recent with the scan operations. I think it's in OpenMP5. So here, we don't want to illustrate the many different ways of implementing a recurrence in parallel. So we just wanted to simplify the usage of a very recent feature in OpenMP5, that is the scan directive with a paradigm that is not GPU offloading or multi-threading CPU, it is SIMD execution, okay? So this is what you can see uh, here in this example. But again, remember, you need to understand the properties of your code and what are the dependencies between iterations and how these iterations are mapped to the threads that are going to execute, it, to execute the code concurrently on the CPU or on the GPU, okay? Okay, and that's it. That those are the defects we wanted to cover. Okay, so let me then continue in the optimize your parallel code. Now it's about performance, optimizing performance. You have a correct code prepared for parallelism and parallelized. Now you want to optimize it. So here we will show three recommendations we have for this stage three optimizing. One is related to the GPU and the recommendations of Teams, Teams Distribute Parallel 4. The other one is a typical uh, issue with C and Fortran codes and what is called the row major and column major array accesses to multidimensional arrays. And the recommendation 15 is about copying data to the GPU that is not needed. So more data than expected. So moving more data and spending time that is not necessary for the execution of the code. So this will impact on performance. So recommendation 10. Uh, I'm assuming that in Fortran, Fortran programmers you are familiar with column major access because multidimensional arrays are allocated in memory in a column major side way. So that means that all the elements in a column are consecutive in memory. If you use iterate on the array using a column major iteration, you are doing a very good access of the data and exploiting locality. If you do it row major for some reason, you are going to go against the locality and this will impact, have a negative impact on your performance. So we want to simplify this in C. Fortran is a row major language. C, sorry, Fortran is a color column major language. C is a row major language. So what that means is that in this case, in C, you are accessing a 2D array A of J and IJ in line number nine. And you first fix the column and then you access all the elements in the column. So you are accessing using a column major, in a column major way, data that is consecutively laid out in memory using a row major specification. That is the way C allocates memory. So you are going to not exploit um, data locality in this way. So this is bad for performance, and this is bad to create efficient data movement and data transfers. Because remember, for data movement and data transfers, it is very, it's best practice to also access data exploiting locality, to do the data transfer faster. So in this case, you can solve the problem in two ways. Either doing loop header interchange, that is what is illustrated here, or changing the access A of IJ by A of JI. The solution, what is the better solution? It's many times depending on the code or preference by the, by the programmer. Here, we have decided not to change the, the loop body, just do the loop with the change. Okay, the other recommendation number nine, we already uh, saw that. Remember, for multi-threaded CPU code, it is okay to use parallel four because it will create threads and distribute iterations among the threads. But whenever you go to an accelerator device, each device allocates not 10, but thousands, hundreds or thousands of threads that are somehow uh, uh, grouped in the GPU hardware. And this is not controlled, cannot be controlled in general by you. So you need to provide additional hints to the GPU compiler of the vendor to make this kind of optimizations to increase performance. 
How can you do that? The best practice recommendation for OpenMP is to replace Parallel 4 by Teams Distribute Parallel 4. And Teams Distribute Parallel 4 will be picked up by the compiler and each vendor will be responsible for optimizing this semantics for the faster possible execution on, the, on its GPU. Okay? So this is the recommendation about using OpenMP Teams to offload work to the GPU. And the last one that we have selected, again, emphasizing data movement, challenge number one for GPU programming. <clears throat> In this case, we have a race of 100 elements and we are transferring, moving, copying data of 100 elements of the arrays A, B, and SUM. When in the code, you can see that only 50 elements are actually used. So there is no need to transfer 100 elements of each array, just the 50 elements that are needed for the 50 iterations of the loop. So again, checking and transferring only the data, not unnecessary data, will increase the performance of your code by re reducing the time that your code invests in data transfers and data movement. Okay, and that's it 